Hi, everybody, and welcome to this episode of the Conscious Grief series. And today I am very excited to be joined by Cheryl Feidelman, the Conscious Codependence Coach. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Some of you who have been following the Conscious Grief series will recognize Cheryl, who is a very dear coach to me and we've been working together for around 10 years or so and I can really thank Cheryl for also introducing me to the concept of summits so welcome back Cheryl. Yeah it's so awesome it's so amazing like I I, I now know so many people that know you and know your name and know your work and it's just so amazing to have witnessed that like you really just took it and went with it and are doing so beautifully. It's so cool. Well, thank you. Yeah. And I always feel like this is a very um, important topic to talk about codependency and especially how this can relate to how we process grief. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I wonder. Well, yeah. Sorry. You know, um, the thing about codependence is that from the point of view of my work, it's so anti-change. It's so anti-transition, okay? In our codependent moments, we want things to be the same, right? We don't want to speak up. We don't want to have a voice. We hold things back. We repress. We people please because we don't want anything to change. We want to make sure I'm safe, make sure you're safe, make sure everything is like in its static place, so no one gets abandoned or rejected or shut down. And grief needs change. Grief is change. Something changes. Somebody dies. There's a divorce. There's a bro broken relationship. Grief is the reaction to some sort of transition. And in our codependent moments, we don't want transition. We don't want change. So it's like, it's like they, they are the antithesis of each other. And I just want to say what codependence is from the point of view of my work. So it's clear, like what I'm, what I'm talking about. <clears throat> codependence is when in any moment, when we, when, when we have somebody else in charge of our experience. So in other words, you're in charge of my happiness. I'm happy. It's your fault. I'm sad. It's your fault. I'm looking to you for my reality. I'm looking outside of myself for my reality. I'm dependent on somebody else's mood, somebody else's reality for my place in any given moment. And my three tenets, what I call my three tenets of conscious codependence, are the want to be wanted, the need to be needed, and the, the need to prove oneself. So anybody who's listening, you can you could feel free to take notes on that. Also, my free gift is like, we'll discuss it at the end. It's like a PDF of the three tenants and videos. You get a whole bunch of stuff explaining the three tenants, um, if you want, by, by listening to this interview. So in any moment, if we are we if we are caught in the want to be wanted, the need to be needed, the need to prove oneself, we are in our we are in a codependent moment. And our codependent moments don't allow us to release, don't allow us to grieve, don't allow us to feel what we're actually feeling. We suppress what we're feeling in order to get along, in order to preserve connection with another person. Yeah. Most importantly in our sovereignty, which is where we're headed in my conscious codependence recovery work is our independence of being in our sovereignty. Where we're headed is um, making sure that we notice our own feelings as much as possible, as opposed to repressing them, setting aside in order to serve somebody else's mood. <laughs> so we become more in service of our own mood. Um, we have more permission to take up space with what's actually really happening with us. Oftentimes with grief, I'll give, I'll just, I'll just give an example. Um, my father, I'll, I'll, I'll give a personal example. My father died 19 years ago. And there were so many times, I still to this day cry about my dad dying. Like, I don't know if I will ever accept that. Like, I just, it still breaks my heart. <sighs> 
And in my most codependent time in my life, in my most codependent years, my identity was like the cool chick. Like, I'm cool. Nothing bothers me. Or, you know, I accept life. I'm like a pro at life. I'm fine. I don't need anything. Right. And in those times, I would never admit that I'm still sad about my dad dying. I would cover it up. I would push it away. I didn't want to tell anybody that. I didn't want to tell any guys that I was dating. I didn't want to tell any other family members. I didn't think they could hear it. I didn't think it was cool. I didn't think it was acceptable. And so that may very well have stunted the grief grief process for me because I didn't want to expose my grief process because it was more important to me unconsciously that other people thought that I was fine. Mm -hmm. And this I'm fine thing is a big thing in grief. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. Really? Most importantly, like it may occur as if, well, I just don't want to admit it to these other people that I'm fine. Most importantly, I mean, I don't want to admit it to these other people that I'm hurting, but most importantly, are we admitting it to ourselves? That's most the most important place to expose our truth is to ourselves. I know I just said a lot, but I, I can go on forever. I'll pause there for a second. So, yeah. Well, it's interesting to hear you speak about your own, your own grief. And, mm-hmm. and as someone who, you know, who it, you, you would say that you were, I don't know, a recovering codependent. Mm-hmm. Um, so if somebody like, what is it that makes somebody codependent, would you say? Well, I mean, it's a myriad of things. Ultimately, I look at codependence as a way in which we demonstrate our unhealed trauma in relationship with others. Always, most importantly, in relationship with ourselves. Oftentimes, something happened in our childhood. I'll use myself as an example again. Um, it doesn't have to be as extreme as my situation. I feel like I have like a really extreme situation, but not everybody has such an extreme situation and still can have what I call covert trauma. So there's covert trauma and there's overt trauma, overt trauma being something super obvious happened. You know, there was obvious abuse when you were a kid, um, or there was obvious neglect. Um, for some people there's covert trauma and we're like, you know, maybe your parents were just really busy. They weren't super mean. They were just busy doing their own thing and they weren't paying attention or validating your experience. So for my situation, my mom was, I don't, we, we don't ever, we never got a diagnosis, like a specific diagnosis for my mom, but she was like in and out of mental hospitals and just wild, wildly not, she was just, what's a word for my mom? Unhinged, I guess. She was just like constantly unhinged, like pulling the furniture apart. We always had to get new furniture, new arcs. She's always pulling stuff. She was just wild, couldn't control herself. And so I was always in service of my mom. Like at six years old, when my dad left, I was always in service. I was always taking care of her mental well being, trying to please her, trying to calm her down. And, and was really well trained to ignore how painful it was, what my mom was doing, yelling at me, yelling at everybody. She'd go to take us to the store and she'd be yelling at the workers or whatever. She was always yelling. And so my codependence was, I'm going to ignore how this feels and I'm going to take care of her because unconsciously what I knew unconsciously was this will handle my safety and so oftentimes we have to handle our parents or guardians in order to ensure our own safety well she if she comes down I'll feel better we'll we'll all feel better and so that turned into what I call and this is what I work on in my work is our traumatic identity the identity that was created in order to survive your parents reality or psychology So my traumatic identity was be cool, don't say it hurts, don't say it bothers you, and just be really good at taking care of her. And then as an adult, it became of just taking care of other people and not not feeling my own pain. Mm -hmm. 
And then I, that's when I got me like had this like identity of like this cool, cool chick or whatever you want. Probably could have a better phrase for it, but um and then I kept recreating that dynamic in romantic relationships. You know, for a lot of us, our childhood trauma and our holding environment as children gets recreated in romantic relationships. Romance comes into play and all of a sudden we regress. Codependence is regressive. We turn into a 12 year old version of ourselves, or 14 or six or whatever age that was that um, of that unhealed trauma. And so every guy I dated was my mother. I would just like, completely ignore anything that hurt or anything they did and I would just take care of them so I, I became my mother's daughter with like an every dating situation um so so yeah codependence happens as a result of all different kinds of trauma usually what happens from the ages zero to eight although trauma can make a long lasting impression on your somatics, your nervous system and your psychology well after eight years old. But primarily we look at those ages. Thank you so much for sharing that detail about your own experience. Um, and also, sorry, I'm sorry. That, that codependence, right? Where I'm ignoring, consistently ignoring my own experience piles grief on top of grief on top of grief that I'm not looking at because I'm not looking at my own experience. And this happens very, very often because I coach individuals, I coach couples and I coach groups. And I've had couples who have been together for 30 years. And there are things that have happened in those 30 years that they're not looking at. It bothers one of them. The other one has no idea it bothers them or the other one's over it. And this one's not over it. They're still grieving it. They're still grieving that thing that happened. Or they're still grieving the old form of the relationship because relationships change forms. And, but they're not saying it. They're in a grief state, but they're not saying it. And that's creating space. And it's creating non-polarity. It's creating a roommate situation. Or it's creating um, extremes extremes extreme fighting um uh extreme um what's the word I'm looking for um coldness it could it could cause extremes or it could cause just like a gentle muting over time because one or more people is not t speaking of what they are still grieving right and do you think that's not speaking um is also related to like as you were explaining your own experience that you're just fine and you've been operating in that you know since you're a small young girl with your mom just like in the sort of survival so mm -hmm. when it gets to try like being in a re adult romantic relationship and trying to unpick how you're feeling like you don't necessarily have the tools and articulation to be able to explain your internal feeling world which makes it difficult if you're you know why, why you might be having these outbreaks of mm -hmm. anger or separation arguments yeah so the co yes and the codependent element is i can't say this because you're not gonna like it okay or I feel scared because of you, right? So we go outside of ourselves for the reason why we're feeling what we're feeling, for the reason why we're repressing what we're repressing. That's the, co the, the codependent element of it, where it's like, I can't say this thing because he or she or they are not gonna understand it. Or I can't feel this feeling around this person because they're gonna shut it down or they're not gonna get it or they're not gonna validate it. And so our experience relies completely on what they can hear and what they can handle or, or not hear and handle. So how could, um, how would you coach somebody to become more conscious, if you like, of their own feelings and what they need? 
Mm. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, my work happens through a process. I've developed and in invented my own co conscious codependence recovery program and methodology. So it is a process through my programs to to get to sovereignty, to get to independence of being, to get to knowing and feeling boundaries and keeping them with an open heart. And boundaries, the way that I look at them, are never with other people. They're with ourselves. Boundaries with, with you know, I'm not going to allow myself to say yes when I mean no. That's my boundary. My boundary is I'm not going to allow myself to say no when I mean yes, or I'm not going to allow myself to agree when I don't agree, right? And so these are boundaries with ourselves. Now, the feeling part that you mentioned, I'll, I'll share about the foundational practice of my work, which is like the somatic element or somatic experiencing part of my work, um, which is called the Conscious Codependence TSE practice. TSE stands for thought, sensation, and emotion. So oftentimes when we go outside of ourselves for the source of our experience, in other words, I can't, I can't speak because they're not going to hear it, or I'm scared because they're going to abandon me, right? Or somebody, or your partner or somebody says something and you feel it as an attack and you take it personally. And so you go into defend or prove mode because what ha what's happening is your nervous system is flooding. And when our nervous system floods, we then go into prove, defend, people please. With the TSE practice, it's a practice that my clients practice over time so that we actually can stay in our body, feel all of those sensations when we're feeling some sort of perceived threat or taking something personally, or I don't want them to be mad at me. So now I feel like I have to handle them or take care of them. Actually staying in our body, staying with all of those sensations. And throughout the process, we expand our capacity for emotion and sensation. The more we can feel, the more we can create our relationship with ourselves. We go out of relationship with ourselves when we feel so much and we go, this is so intense, I got to take care of them. Mm -hmm. When actually, when it's so intense, from the point of view of my work, it's a sign to take care of ourselves, <laughs> to handle our own. You know, sometimes it just means like, I'm going to have to um, just take a break right now and go feel all this stuff that's happening <laughs> inside me right now. Instead of trying to talk on top of it, and handle what's happening on top of all this stuff that's going on over here. Yeah, and I think that, um, you know, for some people, that's why the grief comes much later on, because if, yes. you know, if you've been used to functioning in that way, or you've been in a scenario where you have to take care of young children, or, you know, you have responsibilities and there's a uh, survival part of you that kicks in and it's like I can't have all these feelings right now and then it may come much later on and some people may not think that those feelings are related to a grief that was mm. or a death that maybe was over you know 10 20 years ago mm. Codependence can delay a lot of things. Mm. You know, I've had clients, and myself included, when I really started to become conscious of my codependence, and I looked back and I go, I, I can't believe I was operating like that or ignoring that thing for 10 years or five years or 20 years, you know? And this is... um also, I have, there's 52 distinctions of my work. Um, one of the distinctions is what I call codependent regret, is it's one of the phases that not everybody goes through, but some of my clients go through, I went through definitely, where it's like we wake up to our codependent behaviors and then we have all this regret, like I wasted 20 years not feeling that thing. 
-hmm. I had this huge, I had a death in the family or I had a divorce or I had some huge transition and it took me 20 years to feel it. And what was I doing for 20 years? Was I even in relationship with life? Was, was I awake? Was I just an autopilot? And then sometimes there's a sadness, like, man, I just, I just, you know, wasted all this time or something like that. And so, yeah, that's a, a big part that I, that I move through with some of my clients who have the codependent regret experience. And um, just going back to your experience of the death of your father, like mm. when did you kind of start to really process that grief? When did you start thinking I'm, you know, stop sort of saying I'm fine? I don't know. I don't know, but maybe like five, six years ago or something, like I just allowed it. Like I just allowed, sometimes during the day, it will just come through me like, and like I'll tear up or I'll have a, or I'll have a, a lump in my throat or I'll have this just like, a few seconds of like, it's not fair. It's not fair. It's not fair. You know, just, it's like little episode, like a little grief burst, I guess. And I'll just let it move through me. And, and then I move on. And then, and what I've come to see is like, this is just now, this is now part of my life. This is part of my life. Mm -hmm. And that life is, I think, a practice of living with both an open heart and a broken heart at the same exact time Mm. the same exact time and I think at the past I didn't want to face all the things that were breaking my heart and I had a very like hard life I partied and I was like in all these crazy relationships and like I just um I don't know I think I was just keeping keeping intimacy at a distance most importantly the intimacy with my own self in my own heart I really love what you the question yeah I bet you that the awareness of living with an open heart and a broken heart at the same Mm. time that's really beautifully said yeah yeah thanks I I enjoy saying that it feels good to say that because I feel like another big part of codependence is like it's either let's just always look at what's crappy all the time (laughs) or let's not feel what's crappy. Let's just feel great all the time, right? Let's ignore the crappy stuff, which has us keep our grief at a distance, which has us keep maybe there's things about your relationship or your job that aren't working, but we just ignore them because we want to quote, keep the peace. That's also a distinction of my work is keeping the peace. But I think a lot of us, if we really look at it at any given moment, we can say what's super cool about our life and what's not super cool about our life. We can have both lists going at the same time. Mm -hmm. And it's like, it's, yeah, I think what, I mean, I didn't make up this term, but I think it's what, what we call in the healing world, living an integrated and embodied life. Yeah. And that's why, you know, being aware and being conscious you know is that too right and 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 having the understanding that you know that it's okay to feel all the emotions as opposed to like pushing the pushing the more uncomfortable ones aside and trying to just battle through that it's really important to nurture those broken hearts Yeah, and this is where my conscious codependence TSE practice comes in. Because for a lot of us, sometimes the more we feel, the more unsafe in our body we feel. Mm -hmm. And also where the future tripping element of my, I call it future tripping is another distinction of my work. The codependence is a future tripping act. It just is. 
we're future tripping. In other words, if I feel this, then I'm going to feel that and I'm going to feel this and we get totally taken down. I'm not going to survive it. So I'm not going to feel anything. Right. Or if I say this to you, then you're going to say that. And then I'm going to say this and everybody's going to be mad and we're not going to be safe. So I'm not going to say anything. <laughs> so it's like, we are chess playing a few steps ahead constantly. And that's where codependence lies is in the future tripping that gives us our current moment experience of being shut down or repressed or, or people pleasing. But the more we work on this somatic element of my work, which is really learning how to be in any given moment with all the thoughts, sensations, and emotions, the more we can, our body can be actually a safe vessel to feel all these feelings. And also when we're working on the thought, sensation, emotion, we notice sometimes we have a sensation like, oh, your chest is tight or like my armpits get sweaty. That's my nervous thing. Then we can have a thought that interprets those sensations. I'm not safe or this person's going to attack me. And that interpretation of our sensations and emotions isn't always accurate. And that's often where codependence comes in is when we have an inaccurate interpretation of what's going on in our body. And so, so that's another thing in my work with this TSC practice is we start to really be able to embody our thoughts, our sensations and emotions, and actually be in real intimate connection with what's actually happening and not what we, our body and our mind is thinking and interpreting is mm -hmm. happening. Because codependence is also a constant scan for safety, right? You said this, and are, am I safe? Are you mad at me? Or like, I'm feeling this, does this mean I'm not safe? And so we always wanna in our own way, ensure safety. Mm -hmm. And so in our sovereignty, which is the North Star of my work, we bring our own safety because we become safe to feel all there is to feel in any given moment and stay in connection with others. Yeah, and that's not a process that happens overnight, is it? No, it's it's not. It's not. So I have... For, for individual, my individual private program is six months. Couples, I have a couples program that's six months. I have a group program that's eight weeks. I have a group program that's 10 months. So I have these containers of time that the healing happens. Um, I have a free consultation for listeners who might be interested. And that, that's a free 45 minute consultation. And then I have, pro, I have programs available. I'm not really like a one session healer person. I don't do one sessions. It happens over a container of time as we move through the distinctions and we move through the process. Yeah. And it's, um, you know, when we've been operating in a codependent way for most of our lives, it's, mm -hmm. it takes a while to, to untangle that and, you know, <clears throat> Right. And it's beautiful and it's possible. And the work is really, it's, it's beautiful and extraordinary. It's an, it's just um, an honor and a privilege to watch people just be in deep conversations every day and watch people shed this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. It's super highly effective and, and it's a beautiful journey. Um. So Cheryl, how would you, sort of interpret I mean I love that you're the conscious codependence coach um mm -hmm. how would you interpret the conscious grieving for people I think that it's living in permission to feel mm -hmm. Yeah. And as long as it takes, as long as it takes, it's permission and it's timeless. Yeah. Like I said, I've been, I'm grieving my dad 19 years later. I don't know if it'll end until I end. Um, you know, some people go, I've been out of this relationship for six months. I should be over it. If you're not over it, you're not over it. Yeah. And, you know, I know there's the five stages of grieving, you know, and some, some people, you know, 
you may go to stage three and go back to stage one. You may get to stage four and go, I'm almost done. I'm almost to stage five. This grieving might be over. And then you're back at stage two again. Allowing the process to happen, giving it its own life, letting it move through you. You know, sometimes with grief, we have no say in what it's going to feel like or how long it's going to last. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things that I always remember um, you saying to me, you know, in more recent years, have going through my breakup of my marriage and you saying, um, you know, it's a, with breakups, it, and I think it's the same with um, death as well. It's like a process of holding on and letting go. Mm, yes. Yeah. Because we can't just say to ourselves, we're letting go. Our minds just can't do that. Like we we go back and forwards, back and forwards, you know. Back and forth, holding on, letting go, holding on, letting go. Yeah. One of my main master teachers said, said that to me and I'll never forget that the holding on letting go holding on letting go and and um I see it a lot in divorces I don't know if I ever told you this but I, I've worked with I don't know how many couples going through a divorce but at one point I had seven couples at the same time who were going through a divorce and it was like wow I'm in like divorce world now for some reason I just I was like full with divorce people <clears throat> and I noticed each and every one of them both parties at different times you know you know when they said goodbye to me they said it really nicely maybe it'll work out maybe we should get back together or when they left they really slammed the door forget it it's over definitely we're getting a divorce right <laughs> like every this like a little signs of like Maybe we shouldn't have done it. Maybe we should get back together. Maybe I made a, no, they fully screwed it up. No, I'm going to screwed it up. Or maybe it'll work, you know, holding on, letting go, holding on, letting go. Yeah. 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 It's a powerful one. Um, yeah, it is. It is a powerful one. And, and that can, you would know better than me because grief is your specialty. But I imagine that with death, it's similar. Mm -hmm. The holding on, letting go, holding on, letting go. For sure. Um, so tell, um, tell everybody again, just about your free gift so that people can sign up for that. Yeah. Yeah. It's really cool. It's, I'm excited about it because we just sort of put the finishing touches on this new landing page. So if you go to Cheryl and you put your name and email address in, um, you'll get your free PDF which is the three tenets of conscious codependence PDF, which explains the um, developmental roots of each tenant, common behavioral habits. There's some questions in there so you can customize them to your life. And then you'll also get a, this is hard for me to say, a free three day video workshop. And so you'll get a video a day for three days and each video also covers each tenant that goes with the PDF. So you really get a sense of, the work. I really wanted everybody who comes in and signs up on my list to actually come into the conscious codependence community and have an opportunity to experience the work, whether you decide to sign up with me or not, um, that it really serves you. Um, and then in there, in one of the emails, it, probably in every email, you also have a link if you feel moved to book a free 45 minute consultation with me. If you're feeling like you know, you want to see if one of my programs is a fit for you now in your life. Amazing. Amazing. So yeah. make sure you um, take that opportunity. And if you can get a session with Cheryl, obviously I can highly recommend that. Oh, thanks. Um, yeah. Is there yeah, anything okay. else that you'd like to share before we finish? Um, you know, it's just, it's completely possible for each one of us to have all the space that we need and want to feel. That's it. 
Thank you, Cheryl. It's always such a pleasure speaking. Yeah. Thanks, Tara. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody who's watching and listening. Happy healing. Thank you. Bye.